Welcome to Equal Entertainment. I'm Tracy E. Gilchrist. Grammy winner Lizzo is at the center of a harassment lawsuit from three former dancers. The complaint names Lizzo, her production company Big Girl Big Touring, and dance captain Shirlene Quigley as defendants. Among the claims, one of the three plaintiffs said she was encouraged by the singer to take turns touching the nude performers while out at a club in Amsterdam's Red Light District while on tour in February. Lizzo is also accused of calling out one dancer for gaining weight and not being committed to her role, which is important because Lizzo has been a champion of body positivity. Her tour just wrapped up last month. Lizzo has yet to respond to the allegations. Seth MacFarlane is donating $1 million to those who are struggling through the writers and actors' strikes. The money is going to the Entertainment Community Fund, formerly known as the Actors Fund. It will go directly to striking film and television workers. He's one of more than 7,500 donors who've kicked in more than $6.3 million since early May. The fund currently distributes $400,000 to $500,000 a week in response to requests for emergency financial assistance. The SAG after strike is in its third week. The Writers Guild strike is entering its fourth month. Hollywood studios are asking the writers to return to the negotiating table. The meeting between writers and the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers is scheduled for Friday, August 4th. It's a glimmer of hope for the 11,000 striking writers. It's the first meeting since early May. There are no talks scheduled for SAG-AFTRA, whose 160,000 actors went on strike in July. Both unions are making similar demands. Better pay, improved residual payments from streaming platforms, and job protections against artificial intelligence. Lena Waithe has been in front of and behind the camera as a writer and producer. Waithe is creating more space for diversity through her projects and as a mentor with the Rising Voices program. I spoke with Lena about the impact of the strikes in Hollywood and centering stories about BIPOC people. I want to start with Rising Voices, and season three has just come out. I wonder, for those who are not aware of Rising Voices, would you share a little bit about its genesis? And uh, yeah, I'll just start there. Yeah, well, <clears throat> Rising Voices was born out of a desire for Indeed, which people don't know that company. Indeed no. is a, basically a company that's really invested in finding people employment or helping them to get jobs. And you know, they wanted to, in the, I guess, in the spirit of finding employment and jobs, what I do is also a job, being a writer, being a producer, there are people that want to direct. And so what they wanted to do was offer a certain amount of money to give to a director, a budding director to, to film something and, and just to help in that area. And Rishi Rajani, my CEO of Hilmengrad uh, Ventures, decided, well, why don't we split up that million bucks and give 10 directors uh, an opportunity? And so that's what we start. They, they agree with that. And that's what we started doing. So we give, you know, 10 filmmakers 100K to shoot a short film. Some people may think that's a whole lot of money. Most people who are directors know it's it's still not a whole ton when you start to break it all down to, to make a short. But it's, it's an amount to get something done that can show people you know, someone's aesthetic, someone's vision, and it really gives them an opportunity to show what they have, show what they got. And so, and that's really where it began. And usually there's a theme and the theme is centered around work and the idea of work and what work is and the future of work because of what Indeed is about. So there's that connective tissue, but ultimately the filmmakers to come in and be themselves and do things that they ordinarily probably wouldn't get a chance to do because not everybody's handing out 100K to do a short film. So that's really where Indeed <laughs> Rising Voices came about. And we've, and we've had such successes in terms of DeAndre and Quincy, who did yeah. the first season, who are now the producing directors on The Shy. We've had um, Boma, who was in the first season as well, who has gone on to direct episodes of The Shy. And we've just had so many, so many amazing stories come out of it. And we're just really grateful and excited to keep going. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you for that. And you anticipated I wanted to ask you about a few of the folks who'd come out of there, but uh, you, you got that. Um, I do wonder, would you talk a little bit about some of maybe trends or what you were seeing with season three uh, in terms of filmmaking, something that stood out for you? Well, I mean, what's exciting is that every season, you know, we get an opportunity to meet new voices and, and to work with different people. Like this year we got um, Larry was in there um, who really comes from this sort of comedic Broadway world. And so he sort of gave a, a musical mm -hmm. was sort of his, his view into the world. Um, and James, who was a writer who'd been on The Shy, he infused choreography and someone wanting to dance 
uh, and, and having a love for that. So I think what's so exciting is uh, we have filmmakers that are not afraid to treat art like a job in their work. And I think that to me is super exciting. A lot of people don't think of it as a job in a weird way. You know, I think uh, people forget that writers and directors, yeah, it's a dream job for a lot of people, but it's still a J-O-B and it's something that you got to show up for every single day. And so I think that's what was really cool this season was people aren't afraid to incorporate that uh, into the list of employment. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for that. And then I wonder, would you talk a little bit about, you know, times are incredibly contentious. They always are, but we're at this really awful point, especially in this country where, you know, politicians are trying to erase the voices of BIPOC people, queer people, and it's so important to elevate those voices. Being behind the lens is just as significant as being in front of it. You know, true representation, I think, has to be all around. It can't just be in front of the camera. I think we've heard that conversation before, that if a person behind the camera doesn't know the story of the person behind in front of the camera, it may not translate. And so what we try to do is provide opportunities for people that don't often get a chance to direct and don't often get those opportunities because it is difficult. It's difficult to break into directing. There's no way around that, but it's even more difficult if you're othered, if you haven't had access or people just don't want to take a chance. And what's great about us is that we're never afraid to take a risk or, or take a chance on someone. And, and look, not everybody soars immediately, but we think if they at least get the opportunity to fly, they may try again. With the writers and actors strikes and looking for pay equity, um, I wonder if you would kind of touch on how when BIPOC and queer writers and actors are not paid uh, the way they should be, how that affects that storytelling. Well, I think it's it, I think everybody knows this that we we live in a society in which people need to make money so they can live a, a life, not even a lavish life, just a life. And, um, and hopefully a comfortable life. Everybody has that right. And it's just not that comfortable to make a living as a writer, as an actor, and not as a person who's in like movie star status or famous showrunner status. I'm talking about most people in both guilds are working class folk. They're trying to feed their families. They're trying to figure it out just like everybody else. Although it may seem like, well, no, there's a, they live a fancy life and everybody's rich. It's just not true. And so we want to be able to work on things that we don't have to always be singing for our supper for the rest of our lives. We want to be able to make great work and, uh, and be able to retire and live comfortably <laughs> and uh, take care of family. So, you know, I think when people of color, you know, who oftentimes are paid even less, there's even, there's more despair, there's disparity in that as well. Um, in the industry. That's why we all have to continue to talk to each other and figure out what, who's getting paid what so that we can really make sure that there's that things are fair. It, it just makes it so that it makes it more difficult for people who are othered to stay in the business and to want to pursue the business. And we don't, and I don't want those people to be turned away from this industry. I want them to be a part of it and to really benefit from it, just the way the industry benefits from them. And it should really be, it should be equal. And so that's the hope. And, and I want all of us to participate in this in this business in this industry because we have a right to do so you can watch the advocate channel live by downloading our app in the apple or google play store you can also subscribe to our youtube channel for the advocate channel i'm tracy e gilchrist and thank you for watching